belts are for pussies. Chevy pickup for the pieces of this car. It was all, it was a basket case. And I've been driving it ever since. It's a small painting that I did a couple of weeks ago. I actually started on it quite a while ago. I got everything done except the skull. I laid down like a solid black field and then there was sort of a satin finish. And then I cut a stencil of a skull and spray painted it as a repeated pattern with gloss. And then on top of that, and did red and black just sort of blotches, just loading up the paint so that it would drip down. The halftone dots are all painted by hand. This is like something I started doing in my paintings because, well, I like halftones. I like the way halftones look. I wanted to take something that was a mechanical process, like a mechanical printing process, and render it by hand. You know, people that sort of don't know what they're talking about, you know, they see this and they see you know, in the context of what I'm doing, they say, oh, it's Roy Lichtenstein. And it's like, it's nothing like that. It's actually, this is something that Dali did late in his career, was he would, he would render halftones on top of like traditional painting by hand and to create this sort of photographic effect. That was part of my inspiration for that, but also I've been trying to combine abstraction with this sort of representational part of what I do. So what ends up happening is the dots are painted by hand. They're not perfect. They're very loose. And when you get up close on it, you know, there's a lot of texture. It's very impasto. I went to Atlanta for a, uh, I was a guest at a convention that's like, you know, science fiction and comics and fantasy and all that whatnot. So these were photos I took, there was an event where they had artists, uh, you know, doing body paint on different models and so these are uh, photos from that. This is Boston. I, I went uh, went to Boston for a friend's birthday party. Most of this is black and white. I sort of it's it's funny. I sort of prefer to shoot photography in black and white, which is not really you know most people don't really expect that because the you know. Obviously, my paintings are you know, pretty colorful, but... This is a Polaroid. This is an old Polaroid camera. It's a... It's called a CU-5. It's a forensic camera. It was made for taking photo... for uh, medical examiners to take photos of uh, 
things like gunshot and knife wounds. It's uh, it's kind of cool because it's it's got a it's got a, a ring flash on it, but uh, it's it's got a really the the aperture is like really wide open, so you have very shallow depth of field, and the idea is you know these two plates that you put it like if there's like a knife wound on somebody's body, like these like right where the, the where where the ends of these are, that's where the focus is. So so what happens is it uses four by five peel back Polaroid film, so you end up getting its its actual size basically. Like the photo is the the photo that you eventually end up with is the actual size of the you know the gunshot wound or whatever it is, which is why you know that's the desired effect obviously. So these are photos that I shot with that camera. And uh, these, are, these are all Japanese toys. I collect Japanese toys. And I got this idea, like I really liked that, that look of the really short. And I ended up getting really crazy and putting, like I, I had two strobes shooting from the side. And then I had a, I had a seamless that I, I, had, I lit with a strobe with a colored gel. Yeah, these are just all Polaroids that I shot with like my regular Polaroid. I really like how these look because they, to me, they look they look much more filthy than like a a regular camera. You know, they look like photos that you would find in a in a, a cigar box somewhere or something like the, the dirty photos that your your grandfather took. Those you can show. Those are kind of okay. I think there's still some kind of a, like a medical use for these or something that there, there's some reason that they keep making the black and white film. And of course also, you know, photographers that work medium, medium format use it, but actually I don't even think they use it anymore. I've been doing a lot more sketchbook work lately and so I just, I, I, I've never done this kind of thing with using, you know, darker colored paper and then using the white pencil to do highlights and so I so the other day I was I was I was at the art store buying stuff and I said oh well you know I'm gonna I'm gonna grab a sketchbook with some you know gray paper and start trying to do this so I'm working on a project right now with this guy in Japan who's uh, he makes he's a sculptor and he does toys, like he does toys like the sort of classic Japanese monster kaiju toys, like from Ultraman or Godzilla. He and I are working on a collaboration now, so I am, um, I've been doing, basically I've just been doing drawings of weird, weird fucked up monsters and, uh, and sending them to him to see what, he does with them. This isn't what we started with, but this is what we've ended up with. I did a couple of previous drawings to get to this point. Like he actually had the idea of making the the feet into uh, trucks, which I thought I thought was really cool. So I like that idea. It's funny because I started the the original drawing. The idea was he was like a monster, a monster made out of shit with an asshole for a mouth. And, uh, and you know, the, the things kept changing. And then I, the other day, after I finished the sketch, I put it up online. And everyone immediately made the association that this was some sort of commentary on fossil fuels. The drill was like an oil drill and that these were oil trucks and, and that, you know, it was covered in some kind of, like, crude oil or something. I, mean, what, that, I thought that was interesting that people made that association and I, I wasn't even I wasn't even thinking about that but that's one of the good things about being an artist. You just sort of do these things and half the time someone else's interpretation of it is much more interesting than, than what you came up with but of course you get to take credit for it. So...
This is guy's Icarus. He's an Ultraman or Ultra Seven. He's a monster from Ultra Seven. This is called a Hawaii version because this is one that was made for the Hawaiian market. They syndicated the TV show to Hawaii, and it was a big hit. They started releasing the toys for a Hawaiian audience, and the colors are much brighter, and it's you know really like psychedelic kind of colors. And now these are the ones that are like really desirable. Some of them are really expensive. This is more like the regular sort of color version of this guy, so. These are a lot of the different members of the Ultraman family. Let's see, that's Ultraman, this is Ultra 7, this is Ultraman Taro, that's another Ultra 7, these are all Ultra 7 right here. That's the thing, as many toys as you see in here on display, there's e easily that many more that are all packed away in boxes because I just don't have the room for it. I was collecting really seriously for about 10 years and I just fucking not so. Hey, I'm actually kind of tempted to like pack all this stuff away and take out all the other stuff and put it on display just to change things up a little bit. This is Get a Robo, which is like a super robot from the 70s, sort of early 70s, and then these guys are from the Gundam anime. This is sort of the earlier style. This is Gonagai designed this character, and he designed like a lot of the characters from that era. And, you know, much more cartoony and sort of easy to animate. And then, you know, Gundam was kind of a big changeover, and it happened around the same time as Star Wars, where all of a sudden they started trying to make very sort of realistic looking robots, like things that would actually exist in the world. And the show, the, the anime itself, was much more sort of weird and political, and it was about the fight between people who lived on Earth and then the people who had colonized space in these like space stations in orbit. It was pretty uh, complicated stuff for like a kid's show to sell robot toys. <laughs> different series. I mean, this, these are called Jumbo Machenders. They did a whole series. There's probably 70 or 80 different ones from Hopi and different other companies. These are really kind of hard to find because in Japan, I mean, because they're so big, in Japan, when a kid would grow up and, you know, outgrow a toy like this, it would just get thrown away because it took up too much space. And, you know, space is so precious to the Japanese. So now they're really hard to find. These are all uh, called Chokokin, which is, uh, they're all die cast metal toys. And that's, they sort of, uh, that's, this sort of predates like the Transformers. The major difference is like all the Transformer toys, well, they're later, but also they were made out of plastic, whereas these are mostly, you know, made out of metal. What I love about these as an artist is the, just the, the design and the colors and just they're, they're just, they've got so much going on in them that they're really fun to look at. I've always been really into like military aircraft and military history. My grandfather gave me a book of World War I fighter planes. The thing I obsessed over as a kid in that book was all the graphics the pilots would paint on the sides of the planes. That ties right into what I do now, basically. I'm going through like at least 20 years, maybe, well, no, more than 20 years worth of old drawings my work process, I end up with a lot of sort of sketches and preliminary drawings and things like that. Over 20 plus years, I've ended up with like, I mean, literally flat files full of artwork. I'm trying to like find as much of this as I can and kind of sort it out and figure out what's, you know, what's what and 
pick out pieces that I want to use in the show. I mean, see, this is like a whole process right here. Like, like this is like an original. You know, this was a cover for a book. I did a sketchbook collection, and so I did. And actually, I've got three or four versions of this girl before I ended up at this point, and then I did, you know, did a portrait of myself and ended up with doing about three different versions of the face before I got something I wanted. This is like one of the first silkscreen posters I ever did. And this is like the original pencil drawing. You can see I took, this is a drawing I did separately and I Xeroxed and resized it and taped it into place. Now, you know, you do all that stuff in Photoshop. I'm not sure what this is. I think this was probably an illustration for uh, Hustler or something like that. I did a lot of work for Hustler back in, I don't know what that's for, I'm never trying of myself. And this is, actually I think we just saw the, the, the rough of this. I think this is the first drawing that I did for Hustler for a magazine article. It was a double page spread. This is a, an ad for a magazine ad for Sympathy for the Record Industry, which was a record label that I did a lot of artwork for in the uh, in the 90s. This is like stuff from when I was still living in Oklahoma. This is like well, this is right when I came right before I came out here cuz I came out here in 88. When I first met Robert Williams, you know, I showed him a bunch of my work and I remember he he gave me grief because uh, like at the time I was inking all this stuff with uh, like felt tip pens and he's like you you gotta use a brush you know you gotta ink with a brush and uh, he told me to go buy a a Winsor Newton Series 7 brush I think this was I was I wanted to do a zine. This is, again, probably 88, 87. That's another 88 one. Greg Shaw at Bomp Records asked me to do this because he was going to do another series of, uh, compilation series of, like, 60s garage bands. And so each, uh, each volume was going to have, like, a, you know, a photo of a different band or whatever. And, uh, I don't know why we, that, that's a pretty nice looking cover. I don't know why we never did that. I stayed with my friend John McKinney, who had moved out here from Missouri to be in a band called the Telltale Hearts. And uh, I did a crap load of artwork for them at the time. I'm a big crumb collector. I have all of, you know, I have all of his, his comics. I have all of his, his book collections. I have the, those crazy, expensive German sketchbooks that they put out a few years ago. I... Oops, oh, there's the... That's the cover that was the... Uh, I showed the pencil piece earlier. This was an ad for my... Uh, I did a radio show when I was living in Oklahoma. I was a DJ. Well, this is before... Before you could comp, comp stuff in Photoshop. You had to do something like this and then take a measurement and get your proportion wheel and figure out how small or big it needed to be and then make notes for the printer to strip it into the strip it into the negative and because I think on this piece it was reversed in white on top of a a line line drawing. It was like a black and white drawing with an ink wash on it. It's like old school shit, man. Nobody does it that way anymore. It's funny how all this early stuff, I was just all into this sort of mad magazine thing of just like cramming all these little details into into a drawing and I sort of ended up going the opposite way with that. But let's see, 1988, I was, what, 20 years old maybe? It? Yeah. A long time ago. I did some poster images with uh, with the Bride of Frankenstein as like, you know, kind of nude, just sort of wearing kind of like a bikini made out of bandages and, and you know, this sort of sexy stitched together Bride of Frankenstein. And now that's like, 
everybody does that and it's almost like it's one of those things where it, it's like i don't it doesn't even it's not even mine anymore because so many people have run with it but i mean i wasn't the first guy to do devil girls so you know i can't really complain about somebody else an idea belongs to whoever does it the best really i mean you know it's the old saying about the second mouse gets the cheese i did an art show called 669 and the, the poster for the show was this scene of all these devil girls in hell kind of having this lesbian orgy the show was about to happen. I was really busy. I was in that whole last minute thing of getting the show ready. I get a call from Rick Rubin. He said, you know, I want something from you. He said, I want something that's really sexy and really offensive. And I said, oh, well, you know, I, I don't have any new stuff, but I have something that might be, might be appropriate. So, and uh, Rick Rubin showed up at my house in a chauffeur driven 50s Rolls Royce being driven by a this young uh, Sikh guy and he walked into my studio he saw the poster and he said that's what I want on the cover so that was a very easy job so they did the cover the record sold very well that's probably that's the one everybody knows that's the one people always bring up to me that's the one that that'll be fucking chiseled on my tombstone when this record came out they put one up on tower and I said I asked a friend of mine who's in the music industry, because I'd seen these, you know, in people's homes and stuff, and I said, do they, they sell those? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, just call them. They sell them, you know, whatever. And I said, so I contacted them. They said, oh, yeah, we'll sell it to you for $200. I bought it, and then the day came, they said, okay, well, we're going to deliver it to you. So they brought it to my house, and this, you know, kind of rocker dude shows up with this thing and unloads it. And he, he said, "Oh, well, are you are you are you in the band?" And I said, "No, no, I'm I'm the I'm the artist. I did this I did this cover." And he said, uh, "So, well, you know, they're looking for an artist to to hire to to paint these if you're interested." And I, <laughs> I was like, "Well, no, I kind of already have a job." But uh, that was one of my first lessons in. Uh, Humility, I think uh, that um, you know nobody, nobody really, uh, nobody really gets what I do. I don't think, and, and that's okay. So. <laughs>